Welcome to Voices in Value-Based Care. I'm Matt Fusen. Thanks for tuning in. The movement of value-based care is revolutionizing how healthcare providers get reimbursed for delivery of care. On this program, we explore stories from the field about how real organizations are dealing with this change. You can follow the show on Twitter at hashtag Voices in VBC and follow SPH on Twitter at SPH Analytics. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. On the program today, I'm talking with Jennifer Briggs, Chief Operating and Financial Officer with Grippa, and Joaquim Neto, Chief Product Officer with Verato. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you both. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. here. Super interested to hear about the, the patient matching work. And, and when you first just say patient matching, it seems, oh, easy and what's the big deal? And of course, that happens, right, if you're not uh, intimately involved. So interested to hear about that and how it's changing things for you. But before we go down that route, uh, let's hear a little bit about both of you and your organizations. Jennifer, if you want to start us off. Sure. I'm Jennifer Briggs, and I've been with GRIPA since 2002 and have served in a variety of different finance roles throughout that time and stepped into the chief operating and finance officer position a little over a year ago. And when I first started at GRIPA, I was coming out of public accounting. I really didn't have any healthcare experience at all. And it's been so amazing to me to see how different healthcare is today, even versus 18 years ago when I started at Grippa. You know, at that time we were very focused on capitation, and now we've really pushed to the forefront of value-based care and, and healthcare reform. And just seeing how things have changed over that, that length of time has been very, very fascinating to me. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Grippa. Grippa stands for Greater Rochester Independent Practice Association. We're headquartered in Rochester, New York. And uh, we're affiliated with Rochester Regional Health, which is a five hospital health system here in the Western New York and Finger Lakes region. And uh, GRIP is also owned, by, co-owned by a uh, Rochester Regional Physician Organization, which is a group of over 1,300 physicians who are most closely aligned with Rochester Regional Health. It includes both private community-based physicians, as well as physicians who are employed by Rochester Regional Health. And it's really that unique structure of bringing together uh, a large healthcare system along with those providers that puts GRIPA into the position that we're in today, which is our ability to manage over, uh, to, to manage around 300,000 members in value based and quality agreements that we're in today. Excellent. That's a large organization between not only clinicians and, and involved, but the number of patients you have under VBC program. So looking forward to our conversation. and. Uh, Joaquim, if you want to do the same and, and tell us about yourself and your organization a little bit. Yeah, sure. So like uh, like Jennifer and yourself, Matt, uh, I've been in health IT for oh, 10 or 15 years now. Uh, and most of that time, I've been in and around this patient matching idea, uh, this patient matching challenge. Um, so a lot of that time working with MPI vendors directly, um, but also doing things in and around this space. So, you know, interoperability and various healthcare analytics initiatives. But again, always kind of centered around this idea of, uh, you know, how can we create a complete, you know, view of the patient? So, you know, this has always been important um, for patient safety reasons, you know, revenue cycle processes, all these things depend on a complete view of the patient, but value-based care world, idea of patient centricity becomes even more important. So, you know, it's something that's only, you know, kind of getting more important over time. So anyway, I, I started working with Verado in uh, 2015. I had uh, met our founder uh, who'd, who'd come up with this totally new approach to the patient matching problem. You know, things had been, um, I think, a little bit stagnant in this space for a while uh, leading up to that. There was some great technology kind of rolled out in the 90s and the early 2000s, and then we sort of kind of hit a plateau and we're just chugging along. And so um, I met our founder and he had this idea for this uh, reference data approach to solving the problem, which I'm sure we'll get to talk a little bit about. And anyway, pretty quickly, I just said, yeah, this this seems like the next big leap we need, uh, you know, to make a difference here. And so I uh, jumped on board with Verado and, you know, I've had the pleasure of building out this technology over the last few years and working with uh, lots of innovative organizations like uh, Grippa, which is the, you know, it's the best part of the job. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's kind of dive in. First question, talk about how data integrity, especially as it relates to patient matching impacts value-based care initiatives. You know, what is what are the downstream impacts of it? Uh, and Jennifer, we'll start with you. Well, when I think about everything that we're doing, really at the center of all of it is the patient care. You know, we want we want to provide the right care in the right setting at the right time. And, and that's what we're all focused on. 
Uh, but behind the scenes of all of that activity and being able to provide that care, there's a tremendous amount of data and data activity that has to go into place in order to be able to support those value-based initiatives. And at GRIPA, we've, we've spent a, a large amount of time putting the infrastructure in place to be able to accomplish that. Um, deep IT capabilities that allow us to combine data um, and uh, report that to our providers in meaningful and actionable ways. Um, having a provider relations team that works on aligning our provider offices around our initiatives. And then also having a multidisciplinary care management team that works alongside of our providers um, to help manage patients who might need some extra help in, in knowing their and in, in managing their healthcare needs and their conditions. But ultimately, each one of those groups is relying on data and uh, accurate data in order mm -hmm. to be able to communicate with our physicians. And so in building that physician alignment, um, really the key is making sure that the information that we're giving to them is credible. It, um, you know, is very accurate. Uh, I'm sure that, that they can all remember a time when data was wrong and then they don't trust to report it all after that. That's so right. It only takes always, one time, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So we spent a lot of time in making sure that the information that we presented to them is, is credible. And that is one way that, um, that Verado has helped us in being able to make sure that our patient matching is optimal and that the information that we're giving to our providers um, is correct and, and matched appropriately. And honestly, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, GRIPA pulls data and puts it in our repository from over 80 different data sources. So that includes wow. um, everything from medical and pharmacy claims, EMR extracts, daily lab results, hospital data, um, discharge at, at admits, uh, physician practice data, you name it, we're pulling it into our data repository. So we're pulling from a substantial amount of places that all needs to line up and match to make sure that we're reporting that correctly to our providers. So data integrity is something that we've realized is definitely a key component in what we do um, knowing that we need to provide accurate, up-to-date, and actionable information to our providers. 80 different sources, that, that's crazy. Uh, well, can you, you know, tell us a little bit about this, and, and also from your experience outside of GRIPA, is 80 sources kind of par for the course, high, low, little uh, perspective would be great. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we've seen over the years is this sort of uh, ebb and flow of the number of uh, systems that organizations are trying to integrate together that have patient data. So go back, you know, I don't know, five or 10 years, um, and there was kind of this big shift to um, organizations going all in with the big EHR vendors, you know, get your Epic install, your Cerner install, consolidate everything. And there's tons of efficiencies to be gained by that for sure. I think there was a notion that, okay, we'll get down to one system and, you know, lots of problems will be solved, but among them, this patient matching issue. And, you know, that was sort of right around the same time that we started to see all of this innovation uh, in healthcare technology, um, engagement with the consumers, so all these consumer apps come up and then, you know, advanced analytics and population health solutions. There's just so many cool technologies out there now that organizations, okay, great, you've got a central uh, EHR for a lot of your day-to-day uh, -day work, but, you know, we're seeing just what grip a situation they have there. There are dozens and dozens of applications that need to be integrated. And if you're trying to have a patient-centric view and, you know, value-based care initiative depend on that, then, you know, the curve is kind of swung back up. And now you're dealing with dozens and dozens of systems. And not only that, but technology is better. So we're collecting more data. So it's not just the number of systems, but it's the amount of data. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the demand is, is, again, just growing to, uh, to keep that data, uh, high-quality data so that, you know, like Jennifer said, you can make the conf maintain the confidence of all of your constituents that are using it. Right, and and uh, you alluded to this a little bit in your introduction, but a little bit deeper. So what is, you know, some of the patient matching challenges? I think a lot of it is what you've already hit, right? There's just so, such vast sourcing now for data. And, you know, what is it that you guys are doing different, a different approach to it, uh, as you kind of alluded to early on? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you know, kind of, I don't know, put it kind of in the, the context, the history of how I, uh, how I got involved in this new approach. You know, in kind of my first go around with MPI technology, I was working with one of the leading vendors and, um, you know, we invested a lot of energy into uh, developing these, you know, very sophisticated probabilistic algorithms with weighting techniques and all these fuzzy matching things. Um, and it was great and it worked well, but but it didn't get us over the didn't get us over the hurdle. Uh, so, you know, we never really cracked the problem of patient matching. 
And I think what we realized, we meaning, you know, the whole industry, the vendors, the HIM professionals, the IT, was that, you know, in the end, it's really a data problem. We had done all the tech, all the t tricks we could do to sort of get around the underlying data issues. And it was really just a, a data problem that was holding us back. So, you know, we started to see lots of organizations, hey, can I change my data collection practices uh, at registration? You know, do a better job of collecting more accurate demographics, current addresses and things like that for people, which is a, a great goal, but it's also a challenge. And in some cases, it's just not a possibility. You know, if, you know, 12% of the people move every year. That's right. Um, address has changed so you know it's it's not going to be accurate a year from now in your ehr so anyway this data problem i think was it sort of remained the big challenge after we you know deployed all the algorithmic stuff we could do and so that's the perspective that that verado brings is we basically curated this nationwide data set um i think of it as longitudinal demographics record so you know longitudinal patient record but not all the clinical information just the identifying data um and then we use that to uh basically get the right identity decision and as we're linking those 60 systems together you know we've got all these different data points about your past addresses and if you get married you we have your you know new name and your old name um and just having that high quality data we think really gets to the heart of the problem and uh, makes it a lot easier to get get the right answer yeah it can be a bit overwhelming when you start thinking about all the different sources and even if you were talking it just kind of my own personal life is like Oh yeah, if you really wanted to get to all my data and really pull it in where it's meaningful, right? I couldn't fathom because so many things do I do that I don't put an address in for, right? And a lot of times it's phone number anymore is almost becoming a, a, a key, right? I remember my daughter got her uh, first phone not too long ago and uh, she was over the moon about having a phone number. She got a phone number and it hit me. That's going to now track her maybe forever, right? Uh, it's just crazy how things are changing. Jennifer, you know, tell us about Grippa and what you're doing with the technologies and the processes and the data when it comes to really, you know, the, the heart of your organization, which is patient care. So if I, if I sit here and I'm thinking about how this patient matching has really impacted our organizationally, and especially with my, my CFO hat on, and I think about how has it financially impacted us, there, there are a couple of things that come to mind for me. So before we moved to Verado, uh, we had one of our staff members who, it was her responsibility, she was a half-time person dedicated to doing manual resolutions with our former patient resolution vendor. So she would spend half of mm -hmm. her workload doing patient resolutions manually, and then had, had her other set of responsibilities. Um, but since we switched to Verado and have implemented that, she has moved from being from spending a half of her amount of time on that, on those tasks, to only having a handful of tasks to take care of manually every single month. So the, the efficiencies that have been gained from a workload perspective and allowing then her work time to be able to shift toward something that was is very meaningful in a patient care way um, has been really right. important to us. She works within our care management team and is able to funnel patients more appropriately to our care management staff given the extra time and the efficiency gained through, through Verado. Another, another area that comes to mind for me is thinking through the significant amount of work that Grippa has done in the pharmacy space. Um, Grippa has developed its own application called Caretegra that really identifies opportunities around wasteful prescribing and lower cost alternatives and uh, poten potential adverse drug events that could be avoided. And so using that technology to be able to, to produce outcomes like that can be really significant, especially when you frame it within a VBP agreement where you're looking for both that right. high quality and the cost savings. Um, and that is one area where we've been very successful in making those two line up. But at the end of the day, it, one of the key components of making that happen is making sure that we have one consistent story matching those patients together so that we are aligning them appropriately, looking at the full picture of their data, knowing, the, knowing that this patient truly is matched with the right data. And it's amazing what when you can actually make it all happen, right? It's, it, in so many instances, it's a dream. I was just talking to somebody before this and was telling them what I was about to do. And that, you know, from, from what I've learned uh, in a little bit about Grippa, they're pulling off what we would love to have and need to have nationally, right? And it's amazing what they're able to do but then you also get a little concern is like, oh, I know what it's taking them to accomplish this. How do you scale that? And I think that's where something like uh, your technology comes into play, Joaquin and, and Verado, is 
you need technology like this to scale up. There, there is no other way. To your point, you can't have a person doing half their job matching stuff up and try to scale nationally. You know, tell us about your perspective, Joaquim, about, you know, now, but also moving forward, the importance of this. And, and I'm assuming you guys are built to scale and, and looking to scale as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, uh, Jennifer, bringing up that perspective of sort of not just the results you get, but the amount of work that your team has to do to get those results. So, you know, everyone knows how much pressure healthcare organizations are under these days, you know, even six months ago, but now more than ever with limited resources and folks try to do as you know, much as they can, both on the, you know, the actual sort of administrative side and, you know, the HIM teams that are dealing with the data, but then also the IT teams that have a thousand different projects and are scrambling to do different things. You know, it's not just, you know, how accurate can we get this data to be? We're trying to get it as accurate as possible for sure. Um, but in order to to scale, like you said, Matt, it's not just, that doesn't just mean, you know, can we, you know, process, you know, a million records an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it can we get this technology in the hands of lots of different organizations that can actually implement it with minimal effort and they don't have to worry about maintaining it and they don't have to constantly tune it and tweak it and, you know, do all this care and feeding. So, you know, I think, that, I think that's one of the things that over the last, you know, few years has changed a lot too, just as far as the, um, the industry's adoption of, of APIs and acceptance of cloud services and all of those things um, really make it possible for, uh, for us to bring solutions like this that work great. They have these fancy, you know, things going on inside of them, but it, it makes it so that we can deploy them very quickly and easily um, and kind of scale that way um, and, and relieve some of the pressure on the resources that are so, you know, so strained uh, for, for many other reasons. Right. right. And, you know, I'm sure you, like everybody else, uh, well, shouldn't say everybody, a lot of us, uh, we're looking forward to 21st Century Cures Act, which finally passed right before, right before COVID hit which was going to make those APIs and get into that data uh, a lot easier. That's obviously going to be delayed, but hopefully that the vision of the future isn't that far away, right? Where the data is much easier. We can get to it. Your organization and types of orgs can get to it and, and leverage it. And Jennifer, you know, we touched on this a little bit, but uh, a little bit from a physician specific perspective, what role does data integrity play? around value-based care when you're talking to physicians. And, and at the end of the day, if we can't get the physicians on board with what needs to happen to be successful in those value-based care contracts, then it won't work for anybody. And, and data integrity plays a role in that. Tell us about that. Yeah, and, and really physician alignment is key. You need to have the providers focused on something that they are all working toward together and having, having that perspective. And in order to do that, they have to trust the data that, that you're providing to them. You know, we have, we're working with multiple payers and pulling everything together within GRIPA and then pushing out one program to our providers for them to work on. And they have to be able to trust it. Um, they have to be able to take action on it, knowing that they're seeing the full picture. And honestly, I, I don't think that most providers even know the work that goes in behind the scenes in order to be able to provide that mm -hmm. information for them. And that's, and that's really okay because they need to be focused on the patient. But that's just one thing that we consider as we put that together, that that integrity of the data is there so that they can rely on those reports. Um, you know, when we're pushing quality reporting out to our providers, asking them to close gaps in care, we want to make sure that the patients that we're identifying for them really are patients who do have gaps because we've matched them right. appropriately and, and, it's, and it's actionable. Um, we, we can gain efficiencies by not running around trying to chase down data um, well, if we've mismatched people because we've aligned them correctly now and we don't need to, to, to spend time looking in a place where we might have might have needed to do that previously if they were not matched correctly. And the same right. the same thing goes on the care management side as well in identifying the right patients mm -hmm. to offer our care management services to. Um, our analytics within GRIPA are constantly looking for the people who would most benefit from our care management services. And so, again, having that consistent, complete picture of a patient by combining everything appropriately gives us the most accurate look at that to be able to say, you know, this is really the person that we need to reach out to from a care management perspective and then putting that actionable information into the hands of our care management team and the work that they do. So I think it really does all come back to credible information. It has to be timely and it needs to be robust. Um, with all of those data sources included, um, and then be actionable to give them the confidence to act on it. And it's interesting uh, with the care management piece, it, it really is critical to make sure you're getting the most, you know, 
a return on investment in your care management resources, right? Because if you're off a little Absolutely. bit, one, it hurts that, but it's also now the patients that you're putting all this effort into to take care of, you're missing by just a little bit. Um, yeah, exactly. I didn't think of that, that, that need for accuracy and the impact there, but that makes a lot of sense. Because we never have enough resources, right, care management-wise, to spread them as much as we would love to. So that that right. is uh, interesting. So, you know, this will be coming up in the future a little bit from when we're recording. And I'll just make that comment because we're going to talk a little specific about COVID-19. But by the looks of things, it will definitely not be a topic that is in the rearview mirror when this gets uh, broadcast. So just for reference for the listening audience. So, you know, what challenges has COVID-19 presented to GRIPA? And, you know, how have you been responding uh, and what role has data played? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I don't think that any of us would have thought that we'd be sitting here in the position that we are today talking about it in this way because things have changed so dramatically over the last few months. So, you know, we, where we normally would be communicating everything quality measure and initiative related to our providers, we've really taken now a different spin on our analytics to be able to say, how can I most quickly identify those who have been tested for COVID, who is positive, and then how can I stratify those results to find those who are most at risk of complications so that our care management team can reach out to those, to those patients, come alongside the providers, and be able to support them in that way. And I think that that is one area that our care managers have really, really seen a need over these last few months, is that patients who maybe had a very good support system in place because they had, had uh, services coming into their home to be able to support them with their health care needs, might not have those same those same supports right now. So if they had a family member who was coming in to fill a med right. set or be able to help them pick up their medications or whatever the need was, those supports might have been out of place for the last few months. And that's one place where our where our care management team has really stepped in to identify what those needs are and to help them determine how they can get those needs filled in different ways so that they don't just fall through the cracks during this time. Right. Yeah. I did. It is crazy when it's only two months and, and what a vast change in things, right? Two months yeah. makes. And Joaquin, you know, from a, from a national perspective, what have you seen, uh, if anything, a, a spike in need or urgency or kind of demand a little bit be off because focus is so tight? Curious is your, your national interpretation of what's going on. Yeah, for sure. No, we've um, uh, we've been we. I'll tell you, we've been busy lately. It's sort of a, you know a little bit different scenarios than we're you know used to uh, in, in kind of normal life. But you know, with the approach that we have to the matching problem, we're you know we're bringing this additional data to the table um, to get the right identity decision. That's what we do, you know, basically for all our customers. But as part of that, there are other ways that we use that reference data too. And so uh, with with you know as, as soon as COVID nineteen uh, lab tests started coming in. You know, there's folks that are in the patient matching space know that that integrating, you know, third party lab data um, is always a challenge. Um, there's data issues with that just in general, the way the system works. And uh, with uh, with COVID, as soon as public health agencies started producing lots of test results, there is a massive uh, problem with finding out who a test result belonged to, uh, you know, what patient they really belong to. Um, and there are really urgent needs to contact these patients. Uh, and, and there were literally lots and lots of states have testing where they're just they just don't have a phone number to contact a patient um, and they're struggling to reach out to them when they're positive. So just the nature with how we're doing patient identity, we can actually help with that um, and provide some contact points. We have that demographic history. So we've been doing a lot of work related to that. And that's a little bit more on the, you know, more on the public health side of things than the provider side right. of things. But to Jennifer's point about, you know, some of the analytics and uh, zeroing in the right populations to provide us, uh, you know, particular services to, we've also seen sort of big uptick in uh, interest in our ability to deliver so SDOH data. So kind of extending that umbrella of reference data that we have, you know, we can deliver things like, um, you know, household information, you know, do you live alone or do you have family members there? Uh, things like that, that that can impact what kind of care plan you put someone in. So we've had a lot of focus on that area, too. Just can we bring more data to the table to help uh, deal with some of these issues? Yeah, that's awesome and, and timely. And I wasn't thinking, especially with the speed that everybody's moving with the testing and execute, and, and it wouldn't all be nice and ticked and tied in a six-month project, right? Like we all like to at least try to do. Jennifer, we got time for... One last question in about a minute or so. Just curious, what best practices could you share with organizations, individuals that are listening 
around you know patient matching and, and data integrity? Yeah, so the, fir the first thing I think I would say is, is evaluate your options. I think that, that it's easy to get kind of stuck in a rut with what, whoever your vendor is and whatever path you're going down. So evaluate your, your options. Honestly, before we moved forward with Verata, we really thought it would be a very long implementation that would require probably some redundancy and just a lot of, a lot of time from our staff perspective, as well as just time to get it implemented. And we're really, really pleased with how quickly that whole project moved forward and, and got us up and running. So always evaluate your options and test the effectiveness of how do the results differ from what you have today. I think that that's re a really important key. And then the last thing I would say is always with my financial, my financial background, I'm going to say quantify the value. You know, what does this mean to your organization in terms of value? Are there going to be dollar savings within your staff? Are there going to be improvements in your physician alignment that is then going to impact your initiatives that you're trying to roll out with them? How will it impact your organization and how can you quantify that value? Awesome. Thank you both for joining today, uh, especially with everything that's going on and carving out some time for us. Really do appreciate it. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. You can learn more about the show on the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at hashtag Voices at VBC. And be sure to follow SPH on Twitter at SPH Analytics. And as always, you can follow me or connect with me, I should say, on LinkedIn. Until next time, I'm Matt Fusen, bringing you the Voices in Value-Based Care you should hear. Thanks, and have a great week.